Welcome to another episode of the Gun Blog Variety Cast with your hosts, Sean Sorrentino and Aaron Paulette. Welcome to episode 162 of Gun Blog Variety Cast Radio, a proud member of the Self Defense Radio Network. How are you doing, Aaron? I am glad to be home, Sean. I was away for about 10 days, and while it was really great to see people, I'm glad to be back in my own bed. And so I want to thank you and your wife for hosting me. I had a great time in North Carolina. And I also want to thank the Bach family for hosting me in Tennessee. I also want to give a shout out to some of the really cool people that I met while I was up in North Carolina. I got to meet John Dowdy, the very first success story of Operation Blazing Sword, and it was a pleasure to meet him, hang out with him, and pick his brain about how to expand the influence of our message into the LGBTQ communities. That was awesome. I've been looking forward to meeting him for a long time. And I also want to give a shout out to Maria Ryoka Strine and her surprisingly hot husband. She'll think this is funny. I met them and he looks like a firefighter for crying out loud. He looks like one of those man candy that you see on Chicago Fire. And I just looked at her and I just said, well done, girl. (laughs) So, yeah, we had a great time. I talked their ear off at dinner. They talked my ear off afterwards. I was actually late getting home to Sean's place and I felt bad about that. But we had a great time. We talked all sorts of things about prepping and gun legislation and politics, and it was just wonderful to meet them. And then in Tennessee, I got to have dinner with the Batterinas. Yeah, Dennis and Rebecca of Dragon Leatherworks. Yes, and Dennis was wearing his kilt because this is Kilted to Kick Cancer Month. Oh, all right. So you sound like you had a really good time meeting a whole lot of people. I did. Once I knew that my family was safe, it was no longer an evacuation and it was a vacation. (laughs) So I started calling this my evacuation and I had a great time. Now, because people have asked me if I'm all right, let me just reassure you that my house and my family are okay. Really, the worst that happened was that the neighborhood foliage looks like it's gotten a haircut. You know, the branches are gone, the underbrush is thinned out. But where I live, we were fine. Hurricane Matthew did more damage. Hurricane Matthew was mostly wind-based. Irma was more water-based. And we live eight and a half miles inland, we're fine. But the coastal regions, there was one house that was flooded by about three or four feet of water. The biggest difference between these two is the loss of power. Now, last year, mom and dad were without power only for about two, maybe three days at the most. And this time, they were without power for about a week. Now, some of that is probably due to the fact that three quarters of Florida was without power in one way or another. And of course, the larger population centers like Miami and Orlando are going to get that attention first. And I don't really begrudge them that. But I'm hearing all sorts of reports of incompetence regarding Florida power and light. Here's an example. One of our neighbors actually complained in the local newspaper about how he didn't have power, whereas the people down the block had power. And then the day that the newspaper article printed, suddenly, miraculously, we had power. Whereas we had been previously told it was going to be about two more days before we got it. So clearly, FPL realized that they were in a public relations nightmare and they needed to start fixing things. So, yeah, they're getting reamed and I think they deserve most of it. That's interesting because... Later in the show, we're going to have a piece from Miguel, and Miguel's pretty happy with the way Florida Power and Light is handling things. In fact, he's really, really not happy with the city of Coral Gables. I know exactly how you feel about being home. I was away all week across the street from the King of Prussia Mall, which is near Philadelphia, and I hated it. I do not like spending time in hotels away from my home, and I'm not getting to do any shooting. It was work stuff, so yay, that was fun. I did, however, have an opportunity to meet competitive shooter Annette Evans, 
And hopefully I'll be able to get her to be a guest on the podcast soon. She has some really, really interesting stuff to say, and I'd like to hear more from her. Now, refresh my memory, doesn't Annette Evans also like to wear purple? Yes, Annette Evans and I have bonded over the fact that purple is, of course, the best color ever. (laughs) Yeah, that'll be great. Get her on the podcast, do an interview. We can call it the meeting of the purple. (laughs) She did point me in the direction of a class that's down in your area coming up in January. It's Bruce Gray teaches uh, OPSPEC training. I think it's called Practical Fundamentals. She said, this is the class to take. So I'm going to try to put together the 450 bucks, a thousand rounds of ammunition. And if you have any friends that live just south of Daytona Beach, I'd really appreciate if I could find a place to stay. So ask around, will you? I will certainly ask around. You know, if I had any say in the matter, I'd offer you the guest room, but it's not my house to make that offer. So (laughs) yeah, and it's also about an hour, hour and a half from where I need to be. So Yeah, there is that too. You'd be on the road for a while. (laughs) Well, remember our giveaway coming up very, very quickly. We're going to give away a cat tourniquet and a belt carrier to put it in and courtesy of Filster, a Filster flat pack to attach your cat tourniquet to your belt. All you have to do is join GBVC Radio Group on Facebook. Search GBVC Radio and join the group. One of the members of that group will be randomly selected on October the 1st to get the cat tourniquet. So while I've been away, I was listening to the podcast uh, driving back. And so for the past two episodes, I've heard Weird giving my pitch. And while I have to say, I think Weird is a phenomenal co-host. I really don't like the way he delivered this pitch. So I'm going to do it properly. Thanks to Lucky Gunner and Remington for their support of Gunblog Variety Cast Radio. From Golden Saber to Range Rounds, get a full lineup of quality Remington ammo that ships fast at LuckyGunner.com. Well, that sounded wonderful, Aaron. Why, thank you. So let's get on with the show. Have you ever attended a Friends of the NRA banquet? Are you curious about what it's like? Beth shares her experience so you can decide if it's something you'd like to go to. It seems that a lot of times for my podcast segment, I get to share about different events or places or training that I've been through or experienced. And this episode is really no different as I had the opportunity to attend my very first Friends of the NRA banquet. And I don't know if any of you guys are members or participants or if you have been to one of these banquets before, but I thought I'd share a little bit about what I experienced That way, maybe we can compare notes a little bit, and maybe it can help you make a decision on attending an event near you. Now, I have actually seen several emails go out inviting me to these kinds of banquets, but never had the chance to attend. I'd always been out of town, or it just didn't work with my schedule. So when a group of friends of mine from our local Bama Carry group, which is an organization, of course, here in Alabama that is very supportive of the Second Amendment and is constantly looking for opportunities to support, to share with other people, and of course, to meet with representatives specifically in our state about different legislation or different things going on. When I had an opportunity to attend with them, I thought, well, this would be great. This would be a fun time. At least I'll know people and my husband can come along with me and we'll see what it's all about. Well, honestly, I didn't realize that Friends of NRA really has a focus on shooting sports. In fact, basically their whole premise is fundraising for shooting sports which honestly I think is is a fantastic idea because I think this is an opportunity to get a lot of young people involved, to make sure that children are seeing the value and the opportunities that are tied with shooting, with owning guns, with being responsible with firearms. So that was kind of a neat experience. I guess I hadn't been clear on that or hadn't really thought the whole thing through before. And when we got there, we had a really nice dinner and it was a great location in the Tuscaloosa, Alabama area. And basically, we sat back and watched all the excitement happen. There were some awards and some recognitions that were given away. Of course, we stood for the Pledge of Allegiance, listened to the national anthem, and it was just a great time to kind of come together with folks who you know believe what you believe and support what you believe. So it was a really great environment and a great atmosphere. 
but the fun really started to kick up when the auctioneer began his fun little spiel and, and went through all the different items that were up for auction. My husband had never attended anything like that, so he thought that was kind of entertaining. There were a lot of really great items available. There were some firearms. I believe there was a SIG 320, and it was a special engraved item. There was one of the lamps from Tactical Walls, which I think is really cool because it uses that strong, powerful magnet to be able to kind of have a secret compartment for storage. And of course, you can certainly put a small firearm in there, which is awesome because it just looks like a decorative piece in your home. There were different statues and desk ornaments and paintings and I think even a silver pocket watch. So there was a really interesting combination and assortment of items that were up for auction that evening. Honestly, the prices were fairly reasonable. I really sincerely hope that they were able to raise a lot of money from the event. My husband and I had to leave before the night was over because we had a long drive home, but... I'm very glad that we had an opportunity to check out what the Friends of NRA Banquet is all about, to support the event, to also be there with some of our friends from Bama Carey, and um, just to have a little night out with, again, folks who believe what we believe and support what we believe and are able to talk freely about that in a fun, welcoming environment. So I don't know what your experiences have been with the Friends of NRA Banquet. I sincerely wish Sean and I had won something. That would have been cool, but I guess we didn't have any luck that evening. But maybe you guys have. Maybe you guys have been to the banquet before. Maybe it's a regular occurrence for you, or maybe it's something you've been thinking about. So, you know, check out in your area. I know there's a lot of local opportunities, and you can, I believe, go to the friendsofnra.org and select your state and see what kind of activities and events are coming up in your area. Next time, I hope it works out where I can actually go to an event in my local area. That would be awesome, maybe to meet some folks that are close to our community, but I certainly would give it another shot for the entertainment, for the fellowship, and of course, for the great food. It was a nice dinner. We really did enjoy it. Until next time, stay safe and be well armed. You can read more from Beth at usconcealedcarry.com forward slash blog and click on pacifiers and peacemakers in the left sidebar. This podcast runs on your donations. Go to gunblogvarietycast.com and click on the Donate or Subscribe button in the right sidebar. You can make a one-time donation of any amount or subscribe for as little as $2 a month. That doesn't sound like much, but we pay our server costs monthly. A little help from you is a big help to us. So I just want to give a little shout out, a little thanks to our subscribers. We do have some of you subscribing, giving us a little bit of money every month. Some of you $2, some of you $5. Even one or two of you giving $10 a month, and that money is invaluable to this podcast. So thank you very, very much. We're using it to pay for our server costs and any other little things that ha- that come up. This is an expensive game, so I really appreciate all of the support you've given us. And if you're not a subscriber, please consider being one. Felons behaving badly. Man accused of robbing three Charlotte businesses. A Charlotte man was jailed late Monday after police charged him in connection with three recent armed robberies of businesses. Police accuse 28-year-old suspect of robbing the Fish House in the 6,000 block of the plaza, the Arcade Room in the 2400 block of North Tryon Street, and the SBL Business Center in the 2700 block of South Tryon Street. Suspect was charged with three counts of robbery with a dangerous weapon, two counts of second-degree kidnapping, and one count of assault with a deadly weapon with intent to kill. Well, okay, three businesses. It sounds like he robbed three in one go, which is kind of impressive. But regardless of whether or not he did them all at once or in a row or whatever, what kind of person commits these armed robberies? Two counts breaking and entering vehicles fell in Class H. Two counts of larceny of a motor vehicle fell in Class H. Possession of a firearm by a felon fell in Class G and two counts of robbery with a dangerous weapon fell in Class D. All right, so like Weird said last week, crime is this person's job. Oh, but wait, there's more. Dun-dun-dun. 
usually when I look these guys up, I will Google their name just to see if maybe there's a better story than the story I have. And I pull up this story and it's completely different. Instead of string of three robberies, it was man arrested in North Lake Mall shooting. I'm like, what the heck? That's not the story. And then I looked at the date. The date was like six months prior. Police arrested a 27-year-old Charlotte man on Thursday in connection with shots that were fired in the North Lake Mall parking lot on Labor Day afternoon. Charlotte Mecklenburg police charged suspect with two counts of possession of a firearm by a convicted felon and assault with a deadly weapon with intent to kill. Police said suspect and the victim in the case have been in prior altercations that led to Monday's shooting. Police have not released the victim's name or whether the person was injured. Police said they found evidence of the shooting in the parking lot when they responded to the scene about 3.15 p.m., but were unable to find a suspect or victim at that time. Additional information and evidence helped police identify the victim and suspect. Police aren't disclosing the information or evidence. Officers found suspect on Thursday in a home on the 6200 block of Pine Street off Statesville Road in North Charlotte. He had a loaded gun beside him, police said. Police said they also found another handgun and rifle ammunition while searching the home. Police also arrested a different suspect, 27, at the home and charged him with probation violations and possession of a firearm by a convicted felon. Birds of a feather flocking together. Thanks to a thorough investigation by North Division detectives and officers in collaboration with North Lake Mall Security, the gang unit, and state probation, suspect was identified and apprehended in a timely manner, police said in a media statement Thursday afternoon. The North Division would like to recognize and thank North Lake Mall and their security contractor who assisted throughout the investigation and have continued to partner with CMPD in regards to the overall security of the mall. Now... Did you notice that there was no convictions for any of these things that happened six months ago in the list of convictions that this person has? Uh Uh-huh. So he was out on bail still for this particular situation, a shooting in a North Lake Mall parking lot, and he's off robbing businesses. All right, so shots fired on Labor Day afternoon, Labor Day being the early part of September. So not even a year later... Not only is he not convicted for shots fired at a mall, but now he's running around robbing businesses. Yep, pretty much. Our criminal justice system, not at work. Baron is on assignment and will return soon. You're going to hear us talk about this in the show for the next couple months. We're taking a survey of our listeners, and we'd like you to participate. It will help us learn more about you, no matter how long you've been a listener or how frequently you listen to this show. So please take a few minutes and visit our website at gunblogvarietycast.com. You'll find the listener survey link at the top of the right sidebar. It's also in the show notes right at the top, and you can complete the survey anonymously. Thanks. In any situation, you'll get groups of people who have different skills and levels of preparedness. How prepared was Coral Gables, Florida for the long-term loss of electricity? They apparently had their lawyers on speed dial. Miguel tells you what he thinks. Hello, heathens, and welcome once more to the Mental Flea Market. First, a quick update on the post-Irma festivities in Miami-Dade County. I am not going to say that we are back to normal, but there is a very strong sense of normalcy growing. There are still debris to be picked up, but they are mostly in piles out of the way of traffic. Food shelves are not quite populated in variety as before, but you can find stuff, maybe not your favorite brand just yet. I have seen fences down and some other little damage, but amazingly, not a single roof has been damaged in my area. It seems that the building code and the old roofs rebuilt after Wilma did pay off. Uh, Basically, we're doing okay. Not perfect, but we are far from suffering hell either. This is good because material and effort can be redirected to locations like the Keys that really got beat up. And yes, the theme still hurricanes and preparations. But this time I'm going to focus on those who did not prepare. And you are going to be surprised of what I'm talking about. Let's start with this. South Florida knows how to hurricane. And I'm including both private citizens and the government. Holy crap, with all the money and legal stuff spent after Hurricane Andrew, we better be. One of the things you miss after Hurricane, especially in the summer, is air conditioning. In Florida, it's both the heat and the humidity that will make your life miserable and even kill you just like it happened in the nursing home over in Broward County where eight people died. We were without power for 36 hours or so. And if it wasn't for the generator feeding power to the pedestal fans we have, 
my wife would have murdered me or at least greatly injured me. Here in South Florida, you know heat and humidity are your enemies, or at least you should. You spend your life moving from air-conditioned bubble to air-conditioned bubble, yet when a hurricane comes, some will never give a thought about how they are going to deal with living in a structure lacking air conditioning. You don't even bother to buy a fan, much less a generator, but somehow we are supposed to feel pity for you. We don't feel pity and we don't care about you. Florida Power & Light provides electricity to a good chunk of the state. Irma left almost 4.5 million customers without power. Please notice that the word used is customer rather than people. A customer is related to a house or business account, which in my case actually means three people affected by the lack of electricity. You can imagine the rest of the state. Repair crews could not begin their work until the winds have died down enough to be safe, and that happened on Tuesday, September 12th, in the morning when daylight became available. One week later, again, one week later, FPL had returned power to 90% of its customers, and as of today, there were only 16,000 customers out of 4.5 million left without power, and those were in areas that suffered the most damage and needed basically to have a grid reconstructed. That is an amazing feat for any kind of organization, public or private. Now, why do I mention this? Because believe it or not, some chaff souls in positions of leadership in cities like Coral Gables were thinking of suing FPL for not returning power in what they consider a timely fashion, namely instantly or very close to. This is not only stupid, but a sign of a local government you cannot trust in case of emergency because simply they fail on their duty to prepare for a hurricane. Coral Gables is not a poor city by any means. They are all Miami money from way back in the 20s, land speculation, Al Capone, you know, and the town is barely 13 square miles. The combination alone of money and small area should make for a township that could be prepared for almost any, any eventuality. But instead of preparation, you got lawyers. Holy <laughs> How stupidly unprepared can you be? And yes, there were other people complaining about the lack of power and how miserable they were, and you will always have people like that, but the whole local government? What other emergency failures are waiting to happen and will be unanswered because the city of Coral Gables thinks they can fix things by sending lawyers instead of helpers? How useless are they when even the poorest of neighborhoods in Miami-Dade County People got together with or without local government and began cleaning the debris from the streets because they knew repair crews needed access. How many volunteer organizations were already providing, if not bags of ice donated by companies, at least a place where people could gather in an air-conditioned hall or at least stand in front of fans for a few minutes because there was a generator available? And how about those who were ready and did bear down the heat and humidity without complaining? Those who either had the means to generate electricity or simply understood that they were supposed to deal with it and took it. They were the prepared ones one way or the other, but they will not be set as examples or mentioned in the media. No solutions will come about because the unprepared and the complaining will be celebrated and future resources will be misspent towards them. Squeaky wheel. And this is why you must prepare. Lawyers were used because they're an effective threat tool and people rather surrender than battle a protected and expensive fight. You as an individual will mean very little or nothing to a corporation or entity versus the possible millions of dollars a law firm can extract from them. And as a product I have been of the Florida government and corporations about the hurricane preparedness, I cannot let myself be less prepared because <coughs> like the city of Coral Gables will screw it up for the rest of the people. So now you know. Stay safe and see you next time. Get more Miguel daily at gunfreezone.net. This is Bob Main from the Handgun World Podcast reminding you that this podcast is a member of the Self Defense Radio Network. Check out all the great podcasts at selfdefenseradio.net. The main topic segment Dry Fire. So while you were visiting, Aaron, I drug you out into the garage and made you dry fire with me. So how totally boring was that? You know, when people think dry fire, they think of this, well, very dry sort of thing where you're just aiming and clicking and it sounds really boring. I mean, about as exciting as going to the bank. But it wasn't boring at all. 
it was really fun. So the two things that we did different than you were expecting was, number one, I had my little Pocket Pro timer. So we had a beep to start us and a beep that said, this is how long you have. And number two, I was following a program out of Steve Anderson's first book, which actually has a name, but is typically called Steve Anderson's first book. (laughs) So what did you think about what was going on? What did you, what were the big things for you that stood out about what we were doing out there? Again, when I hear dry fire, I think that I'm already aimed and I'm just concentrating on the fundamentals of the trigger pull. Really, what we were doing is we were practicing our draw strokes and, yeah, pulling the trigger sometimes, although I don't think that was really the point. So I don't really know if this would be technically dry fire. But, yeah, we were practicing our draw strokes from a variety of IDPA positions. That was something I'd never done before, so that was really interesting. Every time I started to get a little tired of what we were doing, you'd come up with a new position. You know, we'd do it from surrender pose or we'd do the El Presidente. And that made it really fun because I didn't know what we were doing next. Did we actually do the El Presidente where we turned around and shot three targets, reloaded and shot three more? Because I don't think we actually did anything that involved reloads. No, okay, we didn't do a full El Prez, but you had me do the quick look over my shoulder, draw while turning, and then aiming at the one guy. That particular drill is called the turn and draw. It's the very, very first part of an El Prez drill. Yes, we did Uh do that. I remember that. Okay. (laughs) Well, that's okay. I don't require you to remember the names. It's been, what, two weeks, so I'd forgotten whether we had done that or not. Here's what I really noticed about my performance. I was a lot faster than I expected for someone who hasn't practiced a lot of draw strokes. And you were surprised, too, at at how fast I was. Oh, yeah. And then as we progressed, and I don't remember, it was like five or ten iterations of each. Yeah, basically, depending on what we were doing. Mostly it was ten of the beginning stuff, and then when we got to some of the longer drills, it was five, five again, five at like however fast you can go and then five even faster than you're supposed to be going to, you know, make you work faster. Check out Steve Anderson's first book. It'll explain how it works. It's pretty easy to understand, but yeah, it wasn't just one or two attempts at it. It was probably 20, 30 of them rapidly getting faster. Right. And because I was a newbie, you started me off at, I think, uh, 1.5 And then each time I would do it, you would decrease the time to see if I got any better. And towards the end, I think I was getting about a 1.1 for most of those exercises. The ones that you were getting in that range, you were doing uh, what's called an index. So you weren't actually pulling the trigger. You were drawing and getting the sights on the target at 5 yards and at 10 yards. That may be faster than you can actually pull the trigger in live fire, but that's not the point of the drill. The point of the drill is get to the gun quickly, get it out of the holster quickly, get it up in your line of sight quickly, get the sights on the target quickly. That's how we have to improve, isn't it? We can't try to do, oh, well, here's an El Presidente. We've got to turn and draw. We've got to shoot two shots on each of three targets. We've got to drop the magazine, load another magazine, shoot two more on each target. Okay, we'll just practice that because, oh, that's a little bit of everything, right? Mm -hmm. We haven't practiced each of the little parts in between. How can you possibly do the big thing? So the beginning stuff is literally five yards, stand there. As fast as you can, haul the gun out of the target, get the sights on the target. Yeah. Fast as you can, haul the gun out of the holster, get the sights on the target. That's it. you got to start from just the basics. And in fact, I'm seriously considering doing some reaction time drills, number one. And number two, some get to the holster drills. Get your hand on the gun in the holster, but not actually draw. Because... Getting the right grip at that point is the foundation of everything. If you can't get a good grip coming out of the holster, well, everything you do is going to be compromised by that. Yeah. Well, that last exercise we did where we pull it out of our holster with our right hand, but then we have to transfer it to our <laughs> left hand. Yep. Oh, yeah. There were a few times when it was, okay, that was such a bad grip. If I had continued, I would have tossed my gun out your garage door. So <laughs> let's, let's not do that. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And how many times did I end up smacking my middle finger across the sandpaper grip on my new gun? And I'm like, ow, <laughs> you know, <laughs> breaking yeah. nails, uh, sandpapering the back of my finger. That's really unpleasant. Yeah. 
But yeah, I, I had a fun time because I was faster than I thought I was, and then I improved quickly. And those are the things which are really important to me because, as you know, Sean, and most of our listeners may suspect, I tend to get frustrated easily. And so being able to rapidly see improvement, that's a big thing for me where I go, okay, I can do this. I can get better at this. This is not impossible for me. So that was fun. And as silly as this sounds, your choice of music helped. <laughs> so, so you liked my opera? <laughs> uh, he's pulling your leg. Uh, Sean actually was playing some techno music, uh, some which I recognized, some which I didn't. And that's my jam. I really like techno music. And it was just about that right frequency of beats just to get us pumped up in the mood okay yeah it, it's high intensity so that helped with the feelings of we've got to go now 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 uh -huh. it was also just fun to listen to listening to that while dry firing was like the difference between if you just go to the gym and all you do is lift weights or if you lift weights while listening to your power mix <laughs> just 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 that extra bit of music to help take your mind off some of the soreness and just to pump you up yeah that really made a lot of difference i really like that so you've never used a timer before what did you think about that well technically i still haven't used the timer you used it for me right but you had to work for the timer you had to draw when the timer said you had to be done when the timer was done there was a there was a thing you know, it, it, it wasn't just when you felt like it. So what did you think about using that timer as driving the drill itself? It was interesting because there was a delay between when you press the button and when the beep sounded. And so there's that certain amount of, okay, anytime now, anytime now, is it going to happen? Beep. Oh, crap. Pull it out. Pull it out. Yeah, that just added to the sense of urgency and... It spurred me to go faster, and so that was neat. The uncertainty of it all really helped because I couldn't get into a predictable pattern of, all right, he's going to say now. It, it, it could be a second. It could be three seconds. I really didn't know. I had to pay attention. At least one time I got caught daydreaming. <laughs> so, so, yeah, all right, stop screwing around, listen for the beep. Another thing about the shot timer is that it is completely objective. It doesn't care if you're ready or not, and you can't lie to yourself about it. You can't go, well, you know, I wasn't quite ready for that, so I'll give myself an extra fraction of a second. No, it, it's all right there. And so because it doesn't care, you get a very fair and objective rating of your score. And so I like that. Now, Sean, one thing I noticed you did is that you had a tendency to anticipate the timer. You actually called it jumping the gun. You would grab for your gun before the beep went off. What happens is, is I've got the timer set to a delay. It's somewhere between one second and three and a half seconds. And when it's like one second, I'm cool, right? I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. Ready. There we go. When it's three and a half seconds, when it finally beeps, I'm like, I, I'm vibrating. I'm like, it should have gone by now. And I'm like, it's now. And I'll jump the gun. Yeah, isn't it amazing how three seconds can feel like an eternity? Oh my goodness, it feels like forever. <laughs> and apparently you didn't realize that I had a delay. You thought I was just like waiting and then pushing the button when I felt like it. Yeah, that's what I thought. I thought you were just messing with me. It's like, nah, we'll make her wait for a bit longer. <laughs> okay, now. <laughs> oh no, you'd have been standing there for 15 seconds going, what the f*** is going on? <laughs> I had to take that one out of my own hands there. <laughs> So, yeah, it's it can be frustrating, but there's this neat thing about it. When you, you holster the gun, you drop your hand, you punch the button to start it, and you're like, oh, crap, it's another operation. I have to do it again now. Like It's just like a fixed program in your body. Your arms come down to their sides. You punch the button. Oh, I got to go again. So it drives you. It drives you fast. So what are your final thoughts on this dry fire thing that we did? Well, with all the different postures and the drills and the addition of the music, which I like, it felt less like work. It wasn't a chore. It was more like dance practice with a gun, which is cool. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Tiffany finishes her three-part segment on the NRA Carry Guard Expo by talking about the good things she encountered within the expo itself, especially the programs made for the ladies. You never really understand a person until you consider things from his point of view. Till you climb inside of his skin, walk around in it. Hey, good people. It is Tiffany here. I hope everyone is having a fabulous week. And I am happy to come back with my third and final installment of audio diaries from the NRA Carry Guard Expo in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, which took place a few weeks ago. Here is the grand finale, I guess, although it's probably not so grand, especially after the horse poop incident last week, which, by the way, I got a couple of notes from people on the horse poop. (laughs) Everybody seemed to like that part of my segment last week. But anyway, here are my final thoughts on Carry Guard, and I hope you enjoy. Okay, so here's an example of one of the things I always like to talk about in my classes. And that is the concept of avoidance, which is more important than de-escalation, which is more important than, you know, solving any kind of problem that may arise. The ideal situation is where you actually don't have a problem to solve because you foresaw it well in advance and took proactive steps to avoid it. Uh, Several of the instructors talked about that in some of the sessions today at the Carry Guard Expo. And sure enough, <laughs> I, uh, I have an opportunity to put that little exercise into practice as soon as I come outside. So putting aside for a moment the protesters who were obnoxious but nonviolent, I need to cross the street to get to my hotel. And there's a guy across the street screaming profanities. An old, disheveled looking guy with a dirty backpack on and he's pointing aggressively and giving people the middle finger as they walk past him. Now, if I hadn't noticed that, I would have to deal with that problem from within 10 feet of him after I got across the street and was confronted by him. But because I'm practicing my, you know, avoidance and situational awareness and all that, I spotted him from (laughs) a block away and decided, "Mm, nope, I'm going to take the long way. So here I am going a little bit out of my way to get to my hotel, but that's much, much, much better than having to deal with this guy on the street because he started some crap that I could have just as easily avoided. That's way preferable than having to go to guns in the middle of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. There's some more colorful gentlemen right here on the street, but they're harmless. (laughs) Just talking smack. The other guy, on the other hand, he was pretty aggressive, so I'd rather deal with the guys talking smack than the guy throwing the middle finger and cursing and being all insane and whatever he was doing. All right, so that's day one off to the hotel. I think this Carry Guard Expo is, you know, better than expected. Pretty cool, all things considered. And like I said, I'm just glad that the NRA is finally at least trying to cater to the defensive community to the CCW world I feel like maybe they heard our cries so hopefully the day two and day three festivities will be as good as day one or maybe even better all right ta-ta for now so I'm at the exhibit hall now sorry about the background noise but uh get past this TV Hey, loud. Sorry. Okay, but uh, just wanted to say I just got the most amazing compliment from a wonderful gentleman named Richard. And Richard is from Green Bay. And he made a point, took time out of his busy day to actually come up to me and say hello and introduce himself and tell me how much he enjoyed our podcast. So that just made my day, and I couldn't wait to tell Sean about it and tell the gang about it. So I just wanted to give Richard a shout-out from the show. Richard, thank you so much for listening, and thanks for having lunch with me. That was awesome. I enjoyed talking to you, and I uh, look forward to talking to you more through the podcast. 
it's always super cool to meet people who listen to the show and they're like, hey, yeah, I love it, blah, blah, blah. You know, it always just like blows my mind. So that was pretty awesome. Hey, folks. So this is the last day of Carry Guard. My festivities have come to an end. I'm headed to the airport. And so bottom line, I think overall the NRA has done a pretty good job with their first stab at putting together a conference geared specifically towards personal protection and self-defense. I have to say I, I was nervous and I did see a few things that gave me pause, but in the interest of being positive and <laughs> sort of glass half full and, you know, optimism and all of that, I'm going to say the Carry Guard Expo went well. I really enjoyed the presentations by John Murphy and John Correa, which I already said they were my main draws for the expo. But in addition to that, there were presentations from uh, Jeff Gonzalez, who's a pretty big name. There was some promising programming for women. The fundamentals are the fundamentals. Uh, So sometimes I get nervous when folks bill things as, hey, this is this is for the ladies, you know, like that, that always makes me nervous. But I have to say this had potential. There were several programs such as, you know, concealed carry for women, which can be a bit different from the typical concealed carry considerations for men. Um, that program was really well attended, which was encouraging because it tells me that there are lots of women out there who, although they may not be new to shooting, they're new to concealed carry or at least curious about uh, options and ways to conceal better, more effectively and more safely. I guess my hesitation was that the the program probably could have been better organized I thought it was excellent that they had lots of different holster types available for inspection and they let the ladies try them on and it was very hands-on and interactive, which was great. But the room was so crowded that it was a little difficult to keep all the logistics organized. There was another women's session that was about drawing from concealment. And so there was a short demo provided by the instructors. And then all the women were equipped with concealed carry holsters. Um, They brought tons of, you know, kind of holsters for the ladies to try out and they let the ladies actually put them on and they had blue guns for everyone and they went through the steps of the draw the nra steps they they did a seven point draw i've taught i've i've learned a four point draw but it was basically the basics of drawing from concealment and that session had the potential to be really good but again it was so crowded and there 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 was a little bit left to be desired in terms of clarity of commands um you know line commands or range commands if you will of course this wasn't a real range they were all using blue guns but it did get a little bit chaotic when the ladies were practicing and you know there was a bit of control lost but again the fact that there were so many ladies interested and the level of exposure that these women got from this program with all the blue guns and all of the sample holsters i thought was was really really promising and i'm hoping that next year with the lessons learned from this one uh, they'll be able to kind of tweak it and hone things and it'll be even better next year so all in all kudos to the nra for the first annual carry guard expo and i'm looking forward to seeing what they do with this programming next year all right guys thanks for listening until next time you all stay safe and keep it centered and even you can follow tiffany at frontsitepress.com Cerakote is a polymer ceramic composite coating that can be applied to metals plastics polymers and wood It's also what will take your plain Jane firearm from basic to full custom. Whether you want a handgun coated in just a single color, your hunting rifle camouflaged for your specific environment, or your competition pistol sprayed in purple, white, and black Carolina cryptic, you want Carolina ceramic coating to do the job. 
Bud and his team of skilled technicians will carefully disassemble and clean your firearm, professionally apply the Cerakote in your choice of colors and patterns, and return your firearm to you in perfect working order. And they also do auto engine parts. When I wanted my competition handgun Cerakoted, I trusted Carolina Ceramic Coating, and you should too. Check out their work on Instagram. Search at NC. that's at C-E-R-A-K-O-T-E-N-C, or go to carolinaceramiccoating.com. And now it's time for Blue Collar Prepping with that bratty kid sister of the gun blogosphere, Erin Paulette. Come on, everypony! It's time for Blue Collar Prepping with Erin Paulette! <laughs> this was the second year in a row that I evacuated for a hurricane. And I'd like to think that I'm pretty good at it at this point. So let me share with you some tips and tricks that I've learned. One, know the order in which you want to load your stuff. For me, this is pretty simple. First, I load my bug out bag. Even if I can't load anything else, that and the get home bag I already have in my car will enable me to be a pretty comfortable refugee for several days. The next thing I load are my guns and just enough ammo for them to fit inside their cases. Now, most people are probably wondering why I don't load clothes first, and there are multiple reasons for that. Clothes are cheap and easily replaced, while guns are expensive and a pain in the butt to replace. Besides, I already have changes of clothes in my bug out and get home bags. I don't want my guns to fall into the wrong hands if looters get to my house before I can return. As a gun owner, I feel that I have an ethical duty to make sure my firearms aren't used by criminals. And in a worst-case scenario, I can always trade a gun for something necessary, like food or shelter or transportation, because guns have intrinsic value. Clothes, not so much. Then I add whatever gear isn't in my bug-out bag, but which would be useful for an extended absence, like camping supplies, or for sorting through wreckage, like tools or protective clothing. Next up are whatever portable electronic devices I can fit into a backpack like my tablet computer and podcasting gear, along with recharging cables and docking stations. If I have the time, I'll remove the hard drives from my desktop and put them into a protective waterproof box, like a Pelican case. So far, all of these have been items which are expensive and difficult to replace, going in order from most useful to least useful. If you're making a list of your own, this is the point where you should put valuable luxuries like expensive jewelry or irreplaceable sentimental items like heirlooms. Then. And only then do I pack extra clothing. And this is where your nice-to-haves go. Things which would be nice for you to have with you, but which can be replaced easily. The last thing to go into my car are snacks and drinks. Two, have duplicates of your toiletries. I don't know about the rest of you, but having a repeatable, reliable bathroom routine goes a long way towards making me feel normal and comfortable. I recommend against packing up your toiletries as part of the evacuation process because this will slow you down and you will probably forget things like your favorite loofah sponge in the shower. Instead, build an overnight bag complete with duplicates of all the things you use when showering, brushing your teeth, etc., and then grab that bag along with the others in step one. That's one less thing for you to worry about and one more thing on your list that's already packed. What's more... You can use this for events other than evacuations. If you're going on vacation or you need to take a business trip, you can grab your overnight bag instead of having to pack, then unpack, then repack your toiletries for another trip. Three, have wonderful friends. Both times that I've evacuated, I have been blessed to have really great people volunteer their homes for me to stay in. This hospitality is amazing because not only does it save me the cost of a hotel room, but it also means I get to meet great people in real life and enjoy their company. I've said this before, and I will say it again. If you are a prepper, you can't do it alone. You need people to help you out. Friends, extended family, other preppers in your group, all of these people constitute your tribe, and you should cultivate those relationships. Go out of your way to help people, and they'll be more willing to go out of their way to help you when you need it. Weird bids a farewell to the Brady Campaign's Dan Gross in the best way he knows how. In This This Week week in Anti-Gun Nuttery. So recently we've got news that Dan Gross will no longer be the president of the Brady Campaign. I have yet to find a statement from Mr. Gross to tell if his termination was amiable or not. Still, since I've been following the group for a number of years, if I had to speculate, 
I suspect Gross was fired. Back in 2001, the anti-gun lobby group Handgun Control Incorporated was renamed the Brady Campaign after Press Secretary Jim Brady, who was severely wounded in the assassination attempt against President Reagan. The group had been helmed by a bunch of hard-left Democrats from New York and the Beltway, but in 2006, still basking in the victory of the federal assault weapons ban, the Brady Board of Directors took a bold move and appointed the former mayor of Fort Wayne, Indiana, Paul Helmke, as the new president. See, Helmke was a Republican, not the Reagan or Bush kind, more like the Michael Bloomberg or Joe Scarborough kind. The Brady campaign was the most powerful force on gun control at the time, and they felt the need to appear bipartisan, and always led with Helmke's political affiliation when possible. Then in 2010, the federal assault weapons ban was allowed to sunset, and the American people stopped agreeing to meaningless gun bans. This, coupled with the rising star of Michael Bloomberg and the loss of nearly all bipartisan support of gun control, meant that Helmke's Republican affiliation was now a liability. So out went Paul, and they hired an ultra-liberal New York ad executive named Dan Gross. And Gross drove the USS Brady campaign right up onto the rocks while Daddy Bloomberg watched laughing. Now Gross is out, and two female lawyers are taking his place likely to try and get some of that female attention that Sham and Watson are demanding mommies are getting. Given that Watts can barely draw a crowd, it's likely wishful thinking. So to say goodbye to Dan Gross, I thought I'd cook up one last audio fisk of him from a TED Talk he did over a year ago. He leads with his backstory and advertisement. Because I came to realize that the challenges to preventing gun violence are actually the same ones that made me love advertising which is to try to figure out how to engage people, only instead of doing it to sell products, doing it to save lives. Or to sell a bill of goods, since we know that anti-gun actions, like those pushed by the Brady campaign, only lead to rising crime. And places that have been relaxing gun restrictions have been enjoying a lower crime rate. But what got Gross to leave his life as a corporate advertiser to start the quixotic life of a corporate gun banner? All of that suddenly changed on February 23rd, 1997, when... My little brother, Matt, was shot in the head in a shooting that happened on the observation deck of the Empire State Building. I'm sorry I had to go through that, but when somebody uses a tragic event as a political springboard, I feel obligated to look at the facts. Dan's brother was shot by a terrorist who had acquired his gun legally. He went through a little gray area when he established residency in Florida to buy his gun, but he passed a background check and had a clean criminal history. Of course, he broke the law of bringing his gun back to New York City, and of course, killing people is also illegal. But hey, a few more laws would have totally prevented this. So how is he going to push his agenda? That comes down to finding common ground, where what I want overlaps with what you want. We've heard it gross before on this show. What common ground is there between a gun owner and a rabid gun banner? What do hunters want? Well, they want to hunt. They love their guns. They believe deeply in the Second Amendment right to own those guns. Yes, hunters do have the right to keep and bear arms, but not because they're hunters, but because they're Americans. I would argue that they are humans, and the right to self-defense and the best tools for that is a natural right for all mankind. The Second Amendment has nothing to do with hunting. That doesn't mean that there isn't common ground. In fact, there's a lot of it, starting with the basic idea of keeping guns out of dangerous hands. I think we all agree with this. Who isn't? Oh, he's an ad exec, so he's giving us a softball so he can feed us a whopper. We can all appreciate how Brady background checks have been incredibly effective in keeping guns out of those dangerous hands. Uh, no, we can't. The Brady background checks are a total sham. The bulk of the denials are false positives. And when a real bad guy is denied, law enforcement does nothing. Probably also appreciate that there shouldn't be thousands of gun sales every day at gun shows or online without those Brady background checks. Well, since I think the Brady background check system is crap, I probably don't mind when people don't use it. That being said, it turns out the talking point that 40% of all gun sales are done without a background check is vastly overstated. In fact, the vast majority of gun sales are with a background check. It's just like there shouldn't be two lines to get on an airplane, one with security and one with no security. Man, he's selling a bill of goods. This is not a given. The TSA has stopped zero terrorist attacks on commercial airliners. They have saved zero lives. But they do inconvenience, annoy, and sexually assault every person who flies in this country. Is it a surprise that this freedom-hating goon loves the TSA? This isn't about taking certain guns away from all people. It isn't? 
you do know that the Brady campaign was the lead player in the federal assault weapons ban, which did just that, right? Of course, later in the talk, he says this. Even two thirds of school shootings happen with a gun taken from the home, including the terrible tragedy at Sandy Hook. He talked about gun suicides using guns from inside the home and school shooters get their guns from inside the home. You could talk about the Brady background checks all you want. When you're using this angle of attack, the only solution is to have less guns in homes. So he's not coming for your guns. He's just coming for your guns. But you know what he's going to be spending the bulk of his talk saying. What does he always talk about? 90% of Americans support expanding Brady background checks to all gun sales. Again, no. I'll spare the regular listeners. Just go back to episode 157 for Dan's last appearance on this show for my in-depth rebuttal on why the universal background checks are not supported by 90% of Americans. And in fact, they're wildly unpopular in America. In fact, only 6% of the American public disagrees. That's about the percentage of the American public that believes that the moon landing was a fake. Okay, now this is a serious blunder. Gross is an ad exec, so he's used to bending the truth to make a sale. Still, when you falsely inflate your supporters and then equate your detractors to nuts who don't believe we walked on the moon, you're getting yourself into a lot of trouble. If only 6% of the people were against universal background checks, number one, you'd have them on the federal level, no sweat. And number two, you wouldn't need to spend all your time telling us how awesome they are. Every day in the U.S., nine kids are just shot unintentionally. So nine times 365, that equals 3,285. Except in 2015, the CDC found that there were 77 accidental deaths of minors by firearm. That's a lot less. Oh, wait. USA Today had an expose where they found the CDC underreported the deaths. They found 141 in 2015. Oh, yeah. Gross is lying. If you tell a big enough lie enough times, eventually that lie becomes the truth. And that's exactly what's happened here. The he thinks he's talking about the NRA, but really, he's talking about himself. I'll be back next week with more Dan Gross and more of his bad faith arguments. In addition to appearing here, Weird is a regular host on The Squirrel Report and blogs at weirdworld.com. That's W-E-E-R-D world.com. Plug of the week. The Pocket Pro Timer 2. So Aaron, the shot timer we were using was a blue Pocket Pro Timer 2. And I think you've already covered pretty much all the important parts from the uh, position of a person who is having to react to the beeps. Now from the guy running the thing. That thing is so simple that I didn't even have to read the directions. I figured out which button it was that turned it on by looking at it and it said on. Push that button. Then... I looked through and it's pretty obvious what it what it does is how much time do you want? Do you want to set a par time or you just want to have a timer timer? Do you want a delay from the start? Do you want a random delay? Do you want a fixed time delay? Do you want no delay at all when it starts? Punch a few buttons up and down here, left and right here, and boom, it's all easy to set. Which is good because as we all know, guys don't read instructions anyway. That is true. Typically, we don't read the instructions if we can figure out how to work without them. But using that timer, like Aaron said earlier, it gives you that sense of urgency. You don't get to decide when it's time to go. So you don't go when you're ready. You go when it's ready. And that's the way competition works. And that's the way defense on the street works too. You're going to draw when it becomes time for you to draw. Not because, okay, well, hold on a second. Let me get myself centered here. Okay, I'm ready. There are plenty of drills and there are plenty of shooting problems that have nothing to do with a timer. But there are certain things that you just need to learn how to do fast. There's never going to be a time where a really slow draw is an advantage. <laughs> there are plenty of times when drawing quickly is an advantage. You may not have to, in any particular circumstance, draw quickly at that time, but you're not going to make the situation worse by drawing faster. Spending the time practicing using a timer to find out how fast you can get is going to pay dividends in the unlikely event you have to draw it for real. And for nothing else, it's good for practice for competition, which you should be doing because competition is fun. The Pocket Pro Timer 2, I've got a link to Amazon for that. 
want to thank Luke from Triangle Tactical Podcast for recommending it to me. He's like, this is the timer you need to have. It's super simple. And yes, it is. It is super simple, easy to operate. Even I could figure it out without too much effort. So check it out. It's in the show notes. It's about $125 for one. Keep an eye on it. Sometimes it drops down into the $100, $105, $110 range. Pick it up when it's cheap and supercharge your training. So before we go, a quick reminder, join GBVC Radio Group on Facebook. One of the members on October 1st will be randomly selected to receive their very own cat tourniquet and a belt carrier and also, courtesy of Filster, a Filster flat pack if you want to carry your tourniquet on your belt. Well, that's our show for the week. Remember that Gunblog Variety Cast Radio is a member of the Self-Defense Radio Network. Find the show notes at gunblogvarietycast.com forward slash episode 162. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Gunblog Variety Cast. Music courtesy of Rob Allen at blog.roballen.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, and Google Play Music. This podcast is made possible by the Firearms Policy Coalition and by contributions from listeners like you. Sean, you're listening to Fascinating Rhythm, composed by Gershwin and played by Dave Grusin. Yeah, freaking purple heathen. This is a URS production.